Hi, I'm Robert Blumen. I am a DevOps engineer at Salesforce. I'll be talking about how, not why, an alternative to the five whys for postmortem analysis. When I joined DevOps teams, I experienced the five whys as a popular analytical method in postmortems. Then I began to look into some of the research, which is known as the new view about how systems really fail and came to the conclusion that the RCA method is misleading and harmful. And I'll present what I think is a better idea. A lot of the research about this comes from the field of industrial accidents, which can cross over to medicine, shipping, aeronautics, and many other areas where accidents can occur, which turn out to have a lot in common with managing technology systems like all of us do. Let's start with what causes incidents to occur. This story is pretty typical about Amazon. According to the writer, some employee made a mistake and that caused part of Amazon to crash in this outage that took place a few years ago. Sounds very simple. Somebody spilled their coffee on a network switch and the internet went down. But it's not really that simple. I, uh, I think this story, this writer uh, Atchison, he had a better explanation of what happened. In his article, he points out that AWS does follow many best practices in the ops area, such as automation rather than typing commands, validation, proper security, and audit trailing. What happened was the ops engineer did make a mistake. That person typed the wrong command, but there was a bug in the script. So it did not properly validate the command and that kicked off a trigger of cascading failures that took down part of their system. You can already see things are more complicated than the simple explanation of one single mistake. Some of the best research in this area is from Dr. Cook, a medical doctor who wrote this landmark paper, How Complex Systems Fail. Dr. Cook gave 18 points about complex systems. I will go through some of these. There's not time to go through all of them, but it is worth reading his paper if you wanna get the full story. In this field, there is often a distinction made between simple and complex systems. Simple systems are linear and sequential. Each part is connected to one part adjacent. Simple systems fail in simple ways. They fail like a row of dominoes falling over in which each domino takes out the adjacent domino. Eric Hulnagel, one of the researchers in this field, he has a great slide in one of his talks pointing out that domino failure imagery is everywhere. And he has a bunch of pictures from media of different types of crises and failures with the domino metaphor. But the systems that we work on are not simple. They are complex systems. And as Heslin says, complex systems fail in complex ways. From Heslin's paper on complex systems failures, he, he says that, and this is quote, the hallmarks of complex systems are a large number of interacting components, emergent properties difficult to anticipate from the knowledge of single components, ability to absorb random disruptions and highly vulnerable to widespread failure under adverse conditions. John Allspaw, another one of the thought leaders in this field characterizes complex systems as having uh, as consisting of components with these properties, diversity, interdependence, adaptive, and connected. Allspaw emphasizes that complex systems exhibit very nonlinear behaviors, meaning a small action or small change can lead to what seems like a disproportionately large event, which is also quite unpredictable. 
the reason it's unpredictable is complex systems are complex. It is difficult or impossible to understand all of the relationships between all of the parts and how the system will respond to a single small disruption. Dr. Cook says in the paper that I posted earlier, uh, this is a quote, small apparently innocuous failures join to create opportunity for a system, systemic accident. One of the themes that runs through this literature is that there is no single cause for an incident. According to Dr. Cook, and I, I quote here, each small failure is necessary, but only the combination is sufficient to permit failure. Multiple things must go wrong in order to produce a systemic outage. Dr. Cook also emphasizes that we take a lot of steps to protect complex systems, and we are pretty good at it. This is a big part of our job, it's designing systems to be resilient, and so they won't fall over if one thing goes wrong. We are pretty good at thinking of many things that could go wrong, and how those things do not necessarily turn into a complete systemic outage. According to Dr. Cook, and this is a quote, there are many more failure opportunities than overt system accidents. I think at this point, it may be evident why the idea of a root cause is not helpful. From this article by Matthias Lafelt, he says, single point failures alone are not enough to trigger an incident. Instead, incidents require multiple contributors, each necessary but only jointly sufficient. It is the combination of these causes, often small and innocuous failures, like a memory leak, that is the prerequisite for an incident. We therefore can't isolate a single root cause. Let's talk about an example. There is a famous incident which is known as the Zeebrugge accident. The photo is of a similar ship. I couldn't find one of exactly that ship. From this paper by researcher Nakamura, he looked at the entire system. He created this diagram explaining how the failure occurred, with the failure being capsizing on the far right. You could see there were multiple causes and that all of these causes in some way contributed to the failure. If you take away maybe even just one of these, you might not have had the failure. Dr. Cook emphasizes that complex systems are always operating on the boundary of failure. They operate in a state in which some of the multiple causes necessary for a complete failure have already occurred sort of like some of the threads in your sweater are broken, but you don't see a hole yet. And it is impossible to eliminate all of these partial failures. According to Dr. Cook, and here's a quote, disaster can occur at any time and in nearly any place. The potential for catastrophic outcome is a hallmark of complex systems. It is impossible to eliminate the potential for such catastrophic failure the potential for such failure is always present by the system's own nature. Systems contain what Dr. Cook called latent failures. These exist because complexity itself is imperfect and because of change. We're always changing our systems. The two main reasons we're changing them is, one is to deliver more business value to our customers, Another one of the main reasons for change are steps that we take to avoid failure, which paradoxically introduce new and different failure modes into the system. Here's some examples of latent failures. These might exist in a system you maintain without causing an outage, but when an outage occurs, you may find that these latent failures were contributing to the outage and did not become evident or even not discovered until after the fact. Let's talk more about defending against failure. 
this is a big part of our job. We defend systems against failure with techniques such as redundancy, auto scaling, load balancing, load shedding, monitoring, health checks, backups. And a big part of defense against failure is us, the people who run systems, because we are very adaptive and we can make decisions on the spot to mitigate potential failures and prevent them from turning into outages. According to Dr. Cook, quoting, the effect of these measures is to provide a series of shields that normally divert operations away from accidents. Because of us, many accidents and outages do not occur. Dr. Cook also emphasizes that complex systems can run in a degraded mode. Everything does not have to be perfect. You can think of complex systems as being always partially broken. They are always failing and in the process of being improved or replaced. And a big reason why this works is because we are able to work around the flaws evident in these systems. This is from a paper by Eric Hallnagel called How Not to Learn from Accidents. He characterized systems as moving through this two-dimensional space in which you have the outcome on the vertical axis and you have uh, prob probability on the horizontal axis. System, you could think of it as a random walk or a walk th through points in this space where you hope that it remains in the green or the yellow and sometimes it does because you're lucky sometimes because of additional contributing causes or bad luck you move into the red part of the space now the problem with root cause analysis should be evident it assumes that each event has one cause which is not true these incidents as i've explained all have multiple causes. And the five whys assumes that each cause has one antecedent cause, and you step through it five times, you find the root cause. This is not true. According to Dr. Cook, root cause analysis is fundamentally wrong. I'm going to read a quote because overt failure requires multiple faults, there is no isolated cause of an accident. There are multiple contributors to accidents. Each of these is necessary, but insufficient in itself to create an accident. Only jointly are these causes sufficient to create an accident. According to John Allspaw, these linear chain of events approaches are akin to viewing the past as a lineup of dominoes. And reality with complex systems simply don't work like that. Looking at an accident this way ignores surrounding circumstances in favor of a cherry picked list of events. It validates hindsight and outcome bias and focuses too much on components and not enough on interconnectedness of components. Some of the researchers in this area have emphasized the subjectivity of root cause analysis. It's non-repeatable because when an event has multiple causes and you're forced to pick one, it's really completely arbitrary which one you pick. And if you did it again or someone else did it, they might pick a different cause. Eric Holnagel has coined the acronym WYLFIWIF, which stands for what you look for is what you find. What he means by that is if you go into the investigation looking for a certain thing, you are going to choose from among many possible contributors the one that meets your preconditions or your preconceived biases, for what you think the cause was. I'm gonna illustrate that with this animation. We start from an incident, suppose there were three immediate contributing causes. There could be a lot more, but I can only fit a few on this slide. You pick one randomly or based on your biases, then you go one level deeper. Say what caused F1? There might've been three contributing causes to that. 
you pick one randomly. And each time you do it, you pick something randomly. And if you were doing the three Ys, you would say F9 is the root cause. But you could see there are really at least nine things going on. There are more because each bubble has maybe three or five bubbles that I didn't draw. So out of quite a lot of bubbles, you really arbitrarily pick this one and calling that the root cause, but it's not. Let's look at another example from this air traffic accident, which looks absolutely horrific where these two 747s collided. I went through some stories about this and I made my own graph. You could see a whole bunch of things happened it was really astonishingly bad luck, which had partly to do with these two planes being rerouted onto the same airport where the controllers in this airport, they did not have 747s landing there. They weren't used to them. A lot of stuff happened and it all contributed to this accident. Now, if you're with me up to this point, if you agree, you might ask, why do we do it? Researchers have identified several reasons. I'll talk a bit more about why. Uh, according to John Allspaw, people don't like complexity. We want to think that things are simple and root cause does give us a simple answer. It might not be correct, but it is simple. So um, it does address that need. And if we find the root cause and we fix it, at least for a time, we can tell ourselves that we've prevented a recurrence of the accident. Other researchers have pointed out different kinds of cognitive biases. I'll talk more about hindsight bias. Hindsight bias makes things appear much simpler in retrospect than they were at the time. According to John Allspaw, uh, and a quote here, knowledge of the outcome makes it seem that events leading to the outcome should have appeared more salient to the practitioners at the time than was actually the case. This means that ex post facto accident analysis of human performance is inaccurate. It always appears after the fact that somebody made a mistake, but at the time it was much less clear. They uh, did not have all the information we have in retrospect and their actions were taken under a much greater degree of uncertainty than we have after the fact. In many cases, there are organizational and political drivers. Some companies require an RCA. The customer may want to know what's happened. The idea of finality means if we can get past it, it helps us deal with the trauma. And it may create the illusion that we found something we can fix. A lot of these analyses focus on human error as a cause of failure. If you think about the guy with Amazon who maybe spilled some coffee on his keyboard, this may be another type of cognitive bias where we tend to look for mistakes that humans made uh, as those may stand out to us more than other, other, types, of, uh, other types of problems. But uh, the, the um, attribution of human error as a cause of failure, it overestimates the ability of people operating systems and as us to understand the consequences of their actions at the time. So what we call human errors are actually reasonable decisions a person made under conditions of uncertainty and stress. What John Allspaw says is, if you list human error as a cause, you're saying, I can't be bothered to dig any deeper. And continuing with this Allspaw 
quote, human error consists of normal human behavior in real world situations under conditions of adaptation and learning. What we do every day is make mistakes and adapt. Dr. Cook emphasizes that all operators have two roles. One is producing outputs and the other is avoiding errors. Producing outputs means keeping the system running so our customers can use it, the business can ship products and make money. Avoiding errors is preventing the system from falling over. Now, to see the importance of producing outputs, consider the following observation. We could easily avoid all errors by turning off the entire system. Why don't we do that? Well, because we need to keep producing outputs as well. And that uh, these two roles are always balanced, but uh, Dr. Cook emphasizes that after an accident, we tend to place more emphasis on avoiding errors and forget a little bit about the importance of producing outputs. Uh, Hall Nagel, who I cited earlier, he talks about how avoiding error itself is a cause of error. The operator, and that's us, we take actions which are aimed at preserving output and avoiding error and those changes we make can introduce errors into the system. Dr. Cook explains that every action we take as an operator is always a gamble. Anything that you change may destabilize the system and result in some kind of an accident. After the fact, it looks like you just did something stupid and careless that caused the outage. But at the time, you were making an educated guess or a calculated gamble of an action you could take that would preserve the operation of the system. Our job as ops is to make calculated risks. And some of the time, we lose. But that doesn't mean it was a bad idea. And given our limited understanding of complex systems, it doesn't mean that it was um, that you're incompetent or that you uh, didn't know any better. This idea in the literature of local rationality uh, comes up. Local rationality meaning the operator, you are doing the best you could at the time. You are not trying to blow up the world. You did things that made sense to you given the information you had, you did not perceive the actions you took as connected to an impending failure because the systems are complex and no one has a complete understanding. There are a lot of reasons why your understanding may be incomplete, including changes that were made that no one told you about, high stress situation, or perhaps a lack of sleep if you got paged off hours. Dr. Bergstrom is one of the advocates of this new view says, um, and this is a quote, human error is never a cause. It is an attribution of other problems in the system, a symptom of those problems, not a cause. Let's look at an example incident here. And in root cause analysis, we ask why five times why five? Is not the number five completely arbitrary? If we kept going, we could do the seven whys and we would get a different answer. Why do we do this anyway? What is the point of doing postmortems? It is not to find the cause. It is to find what are the most vulnerable points of the system that we can improve to increase the stability of the system and reduce vulnerabilities. Given the vulnerabilities that we identify, what is the greatest leverage we have to improve the system? That should really be what we're doing, focusing on the two goals of maintaining stability and avoiding error. 
we should not be asking why, we should be asking how did the system fail? We should understand more about the complexity of our systems and how the parts are interrelated. I have another example here. A vendor integration stopped working. The simple explanation is the vendor changed their behavior. Now, here's how I'm suggesting we approach that. Instead of asking these why questions, we ask how did the system fail? Identify the contributing factors that jointly contributed to the outage. Draw a diagram like those diagrams I showed, and then through that diagram, identify the maximum leverage points to make improvement in your system. Create tickets, put those in your tracking system. Here's a diagram that I made about this integration failure, which showed multiple jointly contributing causes. You could see that any one of these might be something that the organization could improve upon. You might decide not to do all of them, but you could certainly decide what are the top three or five improvements you could make that will make your system more stable. Thank you.